Usually in vacuum, the light just goes straight. If it goes in glass or water, it changes its direction a little bit. Why? Because the index of refraction of water and glass is not one. It's a little bit, the water is about 1.3, glass is about 1.5. And what it does, it refracts the light, so it changes the direction of the light. Um, there are actually not all that many um, materials in nature which can do that. So there's glass and water, there's diamond. Diamond has a particularly nice and high index of refraction, but we are already nearly at the end of, of, of the list. So now, what does a negative index of refraction mean? So usually, Let's, let's assume we have glass here, water here, and a wall in between. Um, and the light comes in at an angle, and then the angle gets a little bit steeper inside the glass. What you do, you basically, what do I mean by steeper? You usually you measure the angle towards the normal with, the, with this wall. And if you have a negative index of refraction, so usually this would go in here, and, and you measure this angle here, and then it would come out down here, but with a little bit steeper angle. Negative index doesn't sound very dramatic. It comes in here and actually comes above the normal. What does this mean? There is, um, for example, if you would put a, an, a pencil in a, in a glass of water with a, water with a negative index of refraction, it would look like this, the, the top of the pencil would actually stick out of the water. This is, this is how, how we would perceive it. There are a couple of other interesting effects. Um, for example, the, the, the red shift, Doppler red shift, is used to measure, for example, the age of the universe. If the universe would have a negative index, the red shift would actually be a blue shift. So it would go in the other, uh, other direction. There are a couple of other effects. One of them is, is the, the, the application of the so-called perfect lens. Um, usually a lens um, can magnify or picture things, but the resolution is only as good as the length of the wavelengths. So typically for visible light, it would be a little bit less than a micrometer, a little bit less than a millionth of a meter. Um, the perfect lens does not suffer from that kind of limitation. So you have in principle a resolution which is infinitely good. This would of course be a nice thing, so, but the question, how do we get a negative index of refraction? Let me start by saying this just does not exist in nature. And not even close, not even something approximate. This is really something which does not exist. So, how can we do this? Um, again, um, if we calculate the, the index of refraction, it is actually calculated by looking at the electromagnetic permittivity which basically gives the response of any given medium to an electric field, and the magnetic permeability, which gives the answer of a medium to a given magnetic field. So typically, um, for vacuum, um, both this, this permittivity, permeability are both equal to one. Most media, they are somewhere close to one, perhaps. 1.1 or something like this. The index of refraction is just the one times the other and the square root of the two. So how do we get to negative index? Turns out that if both the permittivity, which is usually one, and the permeability, which is usually one, are made negative, then also the index of refraction is negative. So then the next question is how do we make both of them negative? The, the thing is, um, if you go with your light near some kind of transition resonance. So the, the transition of the electrons in the medium or in the atom is the same as the wavelengths of the, or the, the energy of the light. Um, around that area, there are large variations of both, um, if, it's, if it's electric, electric transition, large variation of this permittivity. If it's a magnetic transition, there are large variations of this magnetic permeability. And so in principle, if we are close to the, to the resonance for, for, for both of these, then we could in principle get a negative index of refraction. So why is this hard? <laughs> The reason is that um, for, there are two reasons. The one reason is that yes, these exist, these resonances exist, but basically never for both the electric 
and the magnetic fields at the same time. And you would have to. A light field consists of a magnetic component and an electric component. And both of these would have to see exactly the same resonance. That doesn't exist in nature. However, you can do that explicitly. And so the, the way people have done this first, about 2000, is to build tiny, tiny electric LC circuits and therefore creating these, these resonances artificially. And then by the size and how thick you make your wire, etc., you can determine what the, what the resonance frequency is. And then, of course, in principle, you can do it for the same, for the same frequency for both the magnetic and the electric um, uh, properties. And this has been done. It's actually not that tiny. The, the experiments that have been done, these, these circuits are of the orders of centimeters. And um, these um, made the first so-called metamaterials. Metamaterial is a kind of composite material. This is really kind of man-made. But for the light that sees it, it's so small that it looks homogeneous. So if you have these circuits that are about a centimeter big, that means that would be for light, light waves that are a couple of meters long or so. So typically microwaves or so would see um, this metamaterial and would actually effectively see a negative index of refraction. This, of course, was improved quite a bit and was miniaturized for shorter wavelengths, etc. However, there are limits on how far you can miniaturize that. That's the one problem. The second problem is the problem of absorption. The problem is that usually if you change the index, you also change how much the light is absorbed. Now, if you go back to the example of water or, or glass, the light is not absorbed. The light basically all goes through. As much light as you send in from the one side comes out on the other side. With these metamaterials, that's not the case. In fact, nearly nothing comes out on the other side. So one of the big challenges in this field is to actually try to produce something that does not have absorption. So in atomic physics, we have electromagnetically induced transparency, where we, where we really explicitly use light fields to, to make a matter transparent. And at the same time, um, we have the, the um, ability to change these electric and magnetic properties that set this permittivity and permeability to negative. This actually, unfortunately, for the permitti permittivity, this is easy. People do that since a long time. And in fact, this electromagnetically induced transparency leads quite naturally in this direction. However, for the magnetic properties, it's basically impossible. The reason for that is that the magnetic part of the electromagnetic wave couples to matter um, much weaker than the electric. And this is, this is really kind of, this is nature given. The ratio between the two is alpha squared, where alpha is the fine structure constant. So alpha is 1 over 137. So the, the magnetic field effectively couples four orders of magnitude weaker than the electric field. So that means changing, um, changing this magnetic permeability is four orders of magnitude harder to do. The biggest challenge is get rid of the absorption, making sure that the medium is transparent for the light for which we try to change the index of refraction. So um, in, this, in these man-made metamaterials, this is, nobody has found a really good solution how to do that yet. However, if we go to, to atomic gases and use the tools um, that, that we have in our box, um, like electromagnetically induced transparency, which basically means just um, coupling or, or sending the right laser light to couple atomic transition in a smart way. In this case, we can explicitly manipulate our matter such that for, for basically any given frequency, um, the matter is transparent, but still couples very strongly with the, with the light field. And therefore, for example, we can manipulate the index of refraction. However, the challenge in these materials is really getting this magnetic permeability um, 
far away from one and then actually into the minus regions. This cannot be done. With normal atoms, it just cannot be done. So what is plan B? Plan B is to see whether this original I formula, namely n is the square root of, of permeability times um, permittivity, is really all there is to it. And it turns out it's actually not. Um, the, the permittivity shows you how the electric polarization couples to the electric field, same for the permeability and the magnetic field. However, it's possible to have some cross-coupling so that the magnetic permeability couples also to the electric field and the other way around. And it turns out if you have this cross-coupling, this cross-coupling also in a somewhat more complicated manner comes into this, this formula for the index of refraction. In fact, you can then go and say, okay, we leave this permeability, which is so hard to change untouched, we change only the permittivity, such that this whole business about permeability and permittivity all gets zero and we don't need to bother with it anymore, and only these cross-couplings remain. So with these cross-couplings, these we can manipulate as we wish, and the, in the negative index is actually very easy. There are basically two ways to do that, and one um, is kind of nature given, <laughs> namely um, if you have a chiral medium, um, something which like a sugar solution or so, which, which turns the, the, the light polarization, this cross coupling is naturally in. Why do, don't we get negative index of refraction from a sugar solution? The problem is this cross coupling exists, but it doesn't have the right sign. And we can, in nature, we cannot do anything about the sign. It's positive, should be negative. But if we do it by hand, and what does mean by hand? We couple yet another laser field into our atomic gas in a small way. And the, this, this cross coupling is exactly proportional to the, to the strength of this laser coupling. The point is, with the laser coupling, we can determine the phase. And we can make the phase such that it's positive or that it's negative or that it's somewhere in between. So if we, ch if we cho choose the phase the right way, we can actually really get this negative index of refraction. So why hasn't that been seen experimentally? Because now these schemes, they get so complicated, you have these very high densities. So the obvious solution is now to try to find a way to detangle these various jobs. The job of making the medium transparent and the job of creating this cross-coupling. And one way to potentially do that is to actually use some, some composite atomic gases or even composite um, level system where each of them does one of these jobs. And at the end, um, if you put them together, the densities that you need are potentially much lower. And the hope is that this proceeds from the theoretical to the, to the experimental stage in the near future.